Ask an enthusiast if they'd prefer a coupe or a convertible, and conventional wisdom says that they'll take the hard top virtually every time. The perception is convertibles are bought by posers, people who care more about being seen and about being heard than they do about driving. But does that stereotype still hold true? Or have modern convertibles become so good that any losses in body rigidity and dynamics are more than made up for by a drop top's boost in theatre, its exposure to the elements and its increased engine noise? So if there's next to no dynamic penalty involved in choosing the open top version, why wouldn't you? To explore that notion further, we've brought together three of the best convertibles on sale right now, at three very different price points. At just over 280k, the AMG is easily the cheapest, and yet it doesn't feel out of its depth. While it's big and brash, there's also a beauty to its proportions, and what's not to like about its recipe? V8 up front, driver in the middle, and a desire to destroy its rear tyres. Of the three cars we have here, this is the one that argues to make the most sense as a convertible. The hint there is in its name. It's a GT. So unlike the other two, which are more focused in their dynamic intent, this car has a bit more of a, a relaxed vibe. It feels a little bit more like a muscle car, or as John Carey so aptly put it at Car of the Year a few years ago, like a Deutsche Corvette. Despite the fact that this car is the entry-level GT, it remains a seriously rapid bit of machinery. We performance tested it yesterday and it did 0 to 100 in 3.8 seconds and a 12 second quarter. And as I shall now demonstrate with a practical example, Sounds pretty good too. <laughs> it's a really strong engine. It feels muscular, it feels energetic, and it's paired to AMG's seven speed dual clutch transmission, which at speed like this, the gearbox is really smooth and nice and intuitive. A lot of purchase at the rear axle, and you can really carry a lot of speed through turns. Uh, and because there's so much chubby torque, uh, from the 4-litre V8, you can always be a gear higher than you might think you need to be. If you want to drop the gear lower and you get on the throttle nice and early, there is a lot of rear axle adjustability here. And the ESC calibration is really nice too. So if you don't feel confident enough to turn it all the way off, you can set it into the sport setting here and it'll actually give you a pretty decent handful of lock uh, to make you feel like you're driving the car at its limit, but it still has a safety net there in case you get yourself into a lot of trouble. The roof itself uses the same mechanism as the old SLS cab, and it can be raised and lowered in 11 seconds. The triple layer cloth design is effective at filtering out unwanted noises inside the cabin. And with it up, you'll be hard to pick a discernible difference to the coupe in terms of road and tyre noise. And then there's how it looks. With the roof down, it's really low, it's wide, it's mean and it has that sort of flat deck out the back that I think at least really oozes menace. In terms of this car making sense as a convertible, I think we give this one a thumbs up. Okay, disclosure time. The R8 has long been one of my favorite supercars. In the world of very expensive shouty exotics, it can feel almost understated even accounting for the fact that this car is painted a rather ostentatious yellow. Like the AMG GT, the car we have here is the entry-level R8. So that means its aspirated V10 produces 397 kilowatts, 540 newton meters. Being the convertible means it's a little slower to 100 than the equivalent coupe, but the rest of the dynamic package is about as you'd expect. There's quattro all-wheel drive, seven-speed dual-clutch gearbox and one of the friendliest and most approachable handling characters that you can buy right now. That's one of the things I love about the R8. It really telegraphs where the level of grip is, how much purchase you have at each axle. Of course, like most fast Audis, if you 
get a little bit too brave or barrel into a corner too quickly, it will understeer. But there's a real joy to driving this car and to running into corners, knocking it down a few gears, and then punching out the other side and letting that big V10 run all the way to the... 8,500 limiter. I've just discovered a little button here on the center console that makes a really convincing case for buying the convertible compared to the coupe, which is why I've started in this car with the roof up, because when you push this button here, a piece of glass over my left shoulder opens, and that fills the cabin with, <laughs> well, that. That is a really special noise. And this 5.2 litre aspirated V10 is a really special engine. I fear we're gonna miss engines like this in the not too distant future. However, and it is a big however, in this car you do notice the sacrifices that have to be made to make it a convertible. The convertible does share the same aluminium and carbon fibre space frame as the coupe, but because it hasn't got a roof, it requires extra strengthening. So the A pillars are beefier and it has flex free side rails, but that has pushed the curb weight out to almost 1800 kilograms, which is a lot for an agile two seater sports car. That means the R8 Spider doesn't feel quite as sharp or as dynamic as the coupe. And you do on really rough, bumpy Aussie back roads like this, Notice it's a bit of scuttle shake through the windscreen, a bit of vibration in the rear view mirror. But the question I keep coming back to is, can you stomach these negatives when you become so much closer and more intimate with that magnificent V10? The Ferrari is the only car here with a folding metal roof. And with a starting price of $526,000, before any options, it's also easily the most expensive. But remember, this video isn't about comparing these cars with one another. It's about exploring how well they work as convertibles. Opting for the Spider does bring a small weight penalty. This car is 50 kilograms heavier than the coupe, but the engine is such a powerhouse that I really doubt you're going to notice any difference between the two. It has 492 kilowatts, 700, and 60 newton meters. And when you deploy all that, well, I'll show you. Slow down to 50 kilometers an hour. And just like that, we are getting along at a, let's say a very rapid clip. Marinello's engineers are obviously really confident in the way that this car handles. A key indicator there is the fact that unlike most convertibles, which use different spring and damper rates to cope with the additional weight and the loss of rigidity that comes with being a convertible, this car uses the same suspension tune as the coupe. The steering is very sharp. It's only 1.9 turns lock to lock, and that can take some getting used to initially, but once you adjust to how quickly the nose points into corners, this is a really friendly, surprisingly friendly car to drive quickly. A big help there is this being a Ferrari, there is an armada of really deftly tuned electronic systems. And you can see the traction control light flickering away as you exit turns, not holding back much power or really aggressively grabbing brakes. It's really smoothly integrated, but you can just know that the car does have your back. And it's not the, the fun police either. When you switch it across into race or even the other modes higher up in the Manatino, the car does let you move around. And even when you do that, once you get over the fact that you're in a car that is approaching $650,000, it's actually surprisingly friendly and predictable to let move around on the edges of grip. So there are little niggles in all three cars, and that shows that concessions do still exist in the land of open top motoring. What we haven't spoken about, of course, are cars with carbon tubs from makers like McLaren. But even excluding those, the differences between coupe and convertible are now so small that many will think the dynamic losses are worth it for the extra noise and sensations that pour into the cabin when you have the roof down. Take that as a win for posers and for enthusiasts alike.
middle of summer, sometimes you run into plagues of locusts, which as you can see from the front of the cars, can be a little bit problematic. And uniquely with convertibles, if you have the roof down, you can cop a few to the face, which isn't fun at 110 k's an hour. So, yeah, not yeah. ideal. <laughs>